Welcome back to the Telecom TV Summit on the Green Network and our live Q&A show. I'm Guy Daniels, Director of Content, and this is the first of three live Q&A shows. Yes, three, because we've extended the summit to three days due to the, well, quite frankly, incredible level of interest and support. It looks like the green message is finally getting through. Now, earlier today, we held a panel discussion that looked at how to measure and monitor power consumption in networks. And we have already received questions from you on this topic. And indeed, they are coming in even as I speak. Uh, and several of our panelists are back to help answer them during this live show. Now, if you haven't yet sent in a question, then please do so now using the Q&A form on the website. And as always, your co-host for the Q&A show is Ray Lemaitre, Editorial Director at Telecom TV. Ray, our focus today has been about measuring power consumption. And given the sky high cost of energy, it's an obvious area of concern. Yeah, absolutely it is, Guy. Uh, and it's one that fortunately the industry isn't only just starting to address. Uh, the, the need to make use of specific data and then also combine it with network management and other tools has been in the spotlight for a while now. And as the industry shifts to more towards cloud platforms and automated processes, I'm sure we're gonna see some really useful and interesting tools developed for the market. Yeah, I really hope so too. Okay, thanks very much, Ray, because we need to get on with the show. Let's now meet our guests who are eager to help with all of your questions. And joining us live on the programme today are Matthias Fridström, who is Vice President and Chief Evangelist at Aurelian, Terry Jensen, SVP Network and Cloud Technology Strategy at Telenor, Gil Hellman, Vice President Telecom Solutions Engineering and Architecture for Wind River, and Philip Laidler, Partner and MD Consulting at SDL Partners. Hello everyone, really good to see you all again. As I said, lots of audience questions to get through today. So to start us off, it's over to you, Ray. Excellent, thanks Guy. Uh, our first question today is, uh, do you believe that equipment manufacturers are playing their part in reducing energy consumption or are telcos having to shoulder the responsibility in reducing consumption through network design and simplification? Um, so basically, are the telcos having to shoulder uh, all of this effort or are the equipment uh, designers and manufacturers helping as well? Uh, Matthias, let's start uh, with you on this one. Um, you know, how much uh, balance is there in this relationship? Yeah, no, I think that's a really valid question. And I think uh, it was a long, long time when I felt that the suppliers were only putting effort into producing more sort of megabits per whatever unit they could produce. And, and if the power was suffering, that was no problem because power was sort of limitless and so on. And they were just pushing more, getting out to get a better box. But I actually think there's a lot of change here. And I think it really comes from us starting to realize that power is a big cost in our production network. And therefore they need to be careful how much power their boxes are consuming. And I think there was a lot of discussions around five years ago when, when really power became important here. So I would actually argue today that suppliers are actually really good at this. They're understanding that the need for us to limit the power usage is very important. Uh, the absolute perfect production in terms of maximum capacity from a box is not really there anymore. There is need, there needs to be a balance between power and the performance of the box. And I actually think 2023 will be the year when we actually are very much cooperating with the suppliers. I don't think there is room anymore for anyone that comes out with this fantastic box that produces twice as much capacity, but consumes four times more power. I think those days are over. And I would actually argue that we are getting very good support from the suppliers these days. Of course, there's a lot we can do as a provider and as a network operator. There's many things we can do to reduce power in our network, but the suppliers are really 
giving us that performance and are helpful in this. We don't need to drive this ourselves. Okay, excellent. So it sounds like a combination of good network design and simplification and help from the vendor community now as well. Uh, Taya, let's, let's uh, come to you. Uh, do you agree with Matthias here? Are things uh, improving from the supply side? I think I fully agree with what Matthias is saying. So, so uh, we have also seen, of course, a development over, I wouldn't say the last years, but at least the last decade in a way. Uh, and uh, it's no secret that from, from Telnor's side, we are, we are using power and power efficiency as one of the evaluation criteria for comparing uh, different suppliers. And of course, that gives them an incentive, you know, to, to, to drive this uh, forward as well. Uh, and we see that they, they are using that uh, internally uh, with their sub suppliers as well on the chip, uh, for example, and, and those kind of things. So, so, so there has been a, an awareness, I think, as, as what he is saying for the for the last years, uh, that power and power efficiency is, of course, very very important. And of course, it's not only power and, and energy, but it's also the climate impact, which takes it to a broader, a bit of a broader kind of context. So, so, uh, and we're also using that as part of the of the evaluation. So. So science-based targets, for example, is part of what we are using and, and uh, then, of course, using those uh, parameters and the requirements uh, from, from that discussion. So, so I think I fully agree with what Matthias is saying. Uh, we also seen, of course, that um, there's a positive momentum and has been for, I would say, the last five, five plus years on, on, on this. Uh, of course, on a, on a mobile operator, the main power consumer in a way is the base station. So, so there are quite a few algorithms who have been developed, uh, everything from, you know, chip designs and switching off uh, modules to, to uh, inputs on network design uh, and using AI, for example, on top of that in order to control the different elements. Uh, it could be advanced antenna elements or, or even switching off, for example, like 3G, for example, uh, during the certain time of the, of the day and so forth. So, so there has been a quite a lot of creativity on, on the how to do this. And then, of course, it needs to be brought into a, to a larger scale. But I think the collaboration is in a positive momentum and of course it's uh, not only the established uh, the suppliers uh, who are working on this, but it's also new companies and new ideas who are coming from, from all new, new startups actually to address how to take this further. Yeah, absolutely. We're seeing some really fascinating new companies get funded and uh, come through with uh, alternatives for the network operators. Um, okay, if there aren't any more comments or responses uh, to this question. Uh, I think we'll uh, move on and go to the next audience question. So over to you, Guy. Yep, thank you very much, Ray. Well, here's our next question. Um, there has to be an easier way of getting all the hundreds and thousands of suppliers and OEMs set up for green compliance or scope three requirements. And it appears that the larger the supplier, the easier that is. But when you get to the small suppliers, the smaller the supplier, the longer it takes. Are there any ideas from the panel about how we can speed up or improve this process? Um, Terry, let me come to, to you first. You know, you, you obviously deal with a lot of suppliers and partners in, in your organization. What do you think? Uh, yeah, no, I think it's an excellent question. On uh, we see that, as I said, there are, there's a good traction around energy and energy efficiency uh, across a number of different partners. So, so, uh, so, so uh, we need to have uh, an efficient uh, process to, to bring every everyone on board. I, I kind of, uh, I think the, the 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 I think the question implies that you know it's easier for bigger suppliers. It doesn't have to be, uh, but uh, I think it's it very much depends on the scope on what we actually are talking about. So. So of course you need to see this into an end-to-end -end perspective. I think we probably discussed that uh, in some of the sessions earlier today as well, that you need to do, to, to go across the whole process from, from all the way from measuring to reporting, analyzing, uh, defining optimization, and then you know, uh, stating principles, and then do, do the full round again. So, so it's important you know, that everyone understands where they are in that, in that process. Uh, and I think, uh, for example, the telcos uh, could, of course, very much help in that to be very cl clear and, and sharp on the on the scope, uh, in particular with, towards the smaller ones. So it's easier for them to be, you know, targeted on what they should engage with uh, and uh, what they should contribute with. Then, of course, it's always a business kind of sem uh, political kind of discussions on how open these systems are. 
uh, from our side, uh, we want to enforce a modular architecture. So that means that we are defining open interfaces to allow uh, also smaller suppliers to have a position there uh, and to hook up, you know, to, to a bigger system. So they can, don't have to do everything, you know, to get going, but they can actually use that information flow. And, and for example, if they want to run an AI algorithm and whatever, so they can quickly, quicker, you know, get from the, their uh, design into a, uh, verification into a live network, for example, uh, and that's also wh why we are working on this. Uh, you know, starting with uh, the discussion about design and scoping, but also quickly taking that to a trial phase, so we can validate uh, what uh, what is the value from 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 these different solutions, for example. And then, of course, the smaller suppliers also should see, uh, and they need to be kept transparently in the loop uh, on on what are the learnings here, so they can also go home and and uh, and further optimize or or further develop if they need. So I think it's. Uh, I, I, I think the, pro the the question that kind of applies that there's a lot of hundreds of, of, of suppliers. Uh, uh, they all have an incentive, I believe, to to move in this direction. Of course, they have a bit of a different views on on how open they should be, how close they should be. Uh, we we want to enforce a bit more openness. So so just to uh, make it easier also for smaller smaller suppliers, smaller companies to engage in this process. So that's what we are trying to to do. And then of course sharing that information and also being transparent on what we want to achieve, I think. Of course, it's probably not a simple, simple answer, but it's a, at least some, some ideas on, on how we are working with this to, to also help uh, smaller suppliers to, to benefit from this. No, some uh, great answers there, Terry. Thanks very much for that. And also an uh, important point that just because you're dealing with a large supplier doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be easier than dealing with one of the, the many of the smaller ones. Uh, Philip, let me come across to you first for, for your observations on, on, on this issue. Yeah, so I, I, I'm going to assume maybe not everyone in the audience understands the terminology, so I'll just explain briefly. Scope 3 is the... Um, carbon footprint relating to your supply chain, essentially. Uh, you're upstream and you're downstream, but for telecoms operators, it's primarily their upstream supply chain. In other words, it's the embedded carbon that comes from your suppliers other than power suppliers, which is scope two. So what this really means is it's all of the embedded carbon in your equipment, um, in your machinery, um, in your uh, civil works activity. And actually it constitutes somewhere between 75 and 95% of most operators' carbon footprint. I mean, we've been very focused on energy and that's cool and that's you know topic of the day, but actually if you look at our carbon footprint as industry, we get the bulk of it yeah, from our supply base. If you want to address your carbon footprint, you've got to tackle your scope three. And the challenge is most of the operators measure and report their scope three in a very high level kind of way. What they do is they use something called industry factor analysis. They say, I spend this much money with this kind of kit, and that is the standard allocation that goes to that. In other words, you know, whether I buy this box or that box, I basically get the same carbon embedded footprint. It's, it's a dollar amount that drives it rather than the box itself. So as an industry, we need to move to the next level down. We need to move to more granular, reporting, so we need to be able to associate embedded carbon with specific devices at the equipment level. And the only way we're gonna do that is if we collaborate both from a uh, supplier and from a customer basis, in other words, from a telco basis and a supplier basis on some much clearer standardizations so that we can say this kit has this embedded carbon associated with it. That is not how it's done today, but that is what we need to move to. So that's the big initiative. The big initiative is to get to this granular product level scope three reporting and capture things like recycling, reuse, um, and these components within our consideration. That's the only way we're going to get to net zero. And that is the next big challenge for this industry. Indeed. And, and Philip, thanks so much for that very clear explanation about the situation we, we, we're currently in and uh, where we need to to go to next. Uh, Matthias, did you want to come in on this one as well? Yeah, no, I, th I think Philip made a very good point there. I think um, we, scope three is super important. And for us, you know, having al almost 500 suppliers for, for parts of our network, you know, we don't produce every service for our customers ourselves. There's a lot of things we need to lease from others. It could be local taste, could be long haul stuff and so on. And of course, uh, the trick now is 
there is such a high pressure on on the telecom market. A lot of costs are going up, and therefore, the pressure on buying the lowest cost at the lowest price per megabit is still there. And it's hard to focus on okay, they're more green than the others. Let's buy from them. Uh, it needs to come from the pressure needs to come from our customers. And when that comes, then the pressure will be on us, and we can start to work this. Before that's going to happen, I'm still afraid that most of us in our industry are going to buy from the cheapest one to sell at the best margin that are, or even the margin. Uh, and, and that's the trick right now. But having 500 suppliers for that part, we then have box suppliers and a lot of suppliers. It's a tough job for the telecom market. There's so many people involved in this scope three area. Uh, but I agree with Philip, we need to start somewhere and we need to get it there very soon. Yeah, thanks, Matthias. We, it is a tough job. And as you said, we do need to start, though. Absolutely. Uh, anybody else want to come in on this question with any comments, or observations? Otherwise, um, Ray, I shall uh, hand back to you. OK, excellent. Uh, thanks, Guy. Uh, the next audience question is as follows, and it's uh, it's quite a long one. So let me take a deep breath here. What if anything, can or should telecom or spectrum regulators do to incentivize telcos to go green? For instance, should they encourage more infrastructure or spectrum sharing? Should they require telcos to refarm their 2G or 3G spectrum? Do regulators have any role at all to play in monitoring or measuring network power consumption. So uh, a really great question there. Um, Philip, can we come to you first? What, where, what do you think about the role of regulators in the, in the whole green network movement? I actually think it's not even a should question. I think we should assume as an industry that they will. And I think that our job will be to set the standards ahead of the regulators rather than react to them. So I think as an industry, we should assume, and we're seeing some of this, we're seeing it in France where um, regulation is more about disclosure, but um, very granular disclosure for the entire ICT industry. We're seeing it in places like Singapore, where um, increasingly they're setting minimum requirements or maximum, depending on how you measure it, for things like PUE. And they are saying all data centers have to achieve a certain level of efficiency. And we're seeing it in other countries. And I think our assumption should be that they will, and they will be increasing pressure for them to do so. And our job is to anticipate this and ideally set the agenda um, and beat them to it. So um, I think there is definitely a role. I'm not sure I would agree with some of the, 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 the specific measures. I think it's more about disclosure and it's more about setting minimum standards. Um, and it's more about making sure that operators are held to account and that they, they use standards and they disclose in a way that's transparent and that's comparable and they help um, you know, drive best practice. OK, so a case of encouragement rather than mandating them to do something. Uh, Terje, what's your thoughts on this? No, I think uh, I probably broadly agree with Philip, uh, maybe a bit from a different perspective. I, I think uh, and there might be, of course, local uh, local variations, of course, and depending on the on the competition and, and the price levels and, and so forth from from country to country. Uh, but I, I think we clearly see that there are expectations on, on for example, reporting uh, both on energy, but also what we just discussed on, on the climate uh, footprint, uh, not only from the from the government, but also from uh, from customers. Uh, so, so we have, uh, for example, enterprise customers who said that uh, you need to do this, uh, otherwise you're not really qualifying to deliver uh, connectivity services to us. So, so also from customers, we're getting these kind of things. Uh, so, so I'm kind of sliding over to that, you know, we have the incentive uh, already, you know, to, to, uh, to improve on the energy and the climate impact. So, so the, the incentives are basically aligned, I would say, on our side. So, uh, of course, uh, the finance side, uh, the energy costs, so, so uh, less energy, the lower costs. So I think that's a clearly a, an impact of, uh, as well and, and the motivation for us. So, so uh, and we, have be, we are working hard on, on, on improving uh, every day on this. Uh, so, so, so that incentive is already on our side, I think. Then, of course, as I said, on the climate side, expectations there uh, is clearly linked with energy as well. So, so the incentive is, is also there. Uh, we have also on our side the incentive, of course, so let's say sunsetting 3G, what we have done in, in a few markets already. 
we have uh, switched off on the fixed side, we have switched off the copper access, uh, of course, that was a clearly uh, uh, energy consumer uh, improvement in a way. Uh, so, so I think the incentives are already on the on the players in the in the industry. Uh, so, so of course, they could be good, you know, to set expectations and, and put a focus and, and raise awareness around this one. So, so uh, I think that's good, you know, to keep that on the agenda. Uh, but to take that to, to you know, to, to, too far, I think, would be probably a bit of a discussion we should have uh, if, if anyone wants to do that. <laughs> OK, yes, good point. Uh, and Philip, you wanted to come back in with a, an extra comment there. Yeah, I, I think we can learn a little bit what we've seen in other industries. Um, I mean, I, uh, one of my in my previous life, I set up a home energy efficiency business and I did some work for the Carbon Trust, which is the UK authorities um, that, that's responsible for driving low carbon practices within businesses. And I set up a new business for them called the Low Carbon Workplace. And that was that was 15 years ago. Uh, What's amazing is how much that industry has changed and how much regulation has changed vast amount to building practices and commercial building practices. At that time, refurbishment was a very unusual option. Um, com companies preferred to build new offices and it was always easier to knock down the office and rebuild a new one. Now, particularly in Europe, the norm is to maintain as much of that building as possible and the regulations at a city level, at a national level, um, strongly encourage you cannot get planning if you knock down the entire building you have to reuse as much of the infrastructure as possible and that's all driven by carbon footprint so you've seen other industries where um, regulations come in and new practices have changed considerably and have had to, uh, led to a dramatic decline in in the carbon impact of those industries the same is going to happen to telecoms as we mature through this journey it will come in and the set the standards will come in and it will just become normal practice Mm, OK, yeah, no, a great point. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, and Terry, you wanted to come back uh, with a, an additional comment as well. Yeah, just quickly on the, I think I was triggered by, by Philip's comment on that. We also see that uh, across industry uh, collaboration is very, very key for us in a way. And it backs, comes back to different scopes, of course, on, on the on the climate part of it. Uh, and the one, one, just one example that, uh, for example, surplus heat from, from data centers to, to get that into uh, into remote heating, for example, uh, in in a, in a city or so on, uh, requires typically a bit of uh, uh, incentives from from the government to do. Of course, it's not only uh, regulations on the on the license of the spectrum and so on, but but it's incentives from the government, you know, to to make use of the capabilities and uh, also to make sure that the partners are collaborating. So, I think there are of course roles to play there. Uh, which might be a bit different and probably the question is imposing or or uh, or you know uh, indicating so so i think there could be uh, roles to play from uh, from various players actually to to make the most out of this because we are consuming of course energy i think on the world if i remember correctly on the on the world scale the telcos are in the in the consuming two two to three percent of the overall energy uh, of course uh, that could also be brought back to the society and brought back to, to other uh, useful things. And, and I think someone also discussing uh, what he called, someone refers to as a scope four uh, of, of this to make sure that we can actually contribute uh, more to the society. And, and I think uh, clearly there is a, a good discussions to have, uh, I think, with the governments on, on uh, how we can make that happen, which then of course requires collaboration. And we call it cross-industry collaboration or even with the government's uh, collaboration to, to make it happen. Yeah, absolutely. A bit more joined up thinking uh, wouldn't uh, go amiss, that's for sure. Uh, and Philip, we'll come back to you, I think, for probably for the final comment uh, on this topic. Yeah, just one last time. Thank you. Um, again, Tony triggered another response in me. Uh, he mentioned um, energy uh, reuse of waste heat and, of course, Waste is, of course, wasteful. And as an industry, um, you know, the ICT industry puts a lot more energy in just to get rid of waste heat. It's an incredibly inefficient way of doing things. And um, there is a big move. And I mentioned PUE, which is a measure of efficiency, which is how efficient are we at extracting waste heat from data centers? And how much more energy do we need to put in to get rid of that waste energy? If we as an industry stop using the term PUE, but use ERE, which is the green equivalent, that in itself sets a different bar because the lowest you can go with PUE is one. The lowest you can go with ERE, which is about energy reuse at data centers and technical facilities, is 
naught. So, you know, it sets a very different ambition. It sets a tone. And I think part of this is also what are your metrics? How do you define your ambition? Where do you want to go? And as industry, we need to drive aggressive, um, highly aspirational metrics. We're not going to get to minus 1.5 degrees Celsius by, by small incremental. And small incremental is incredibly important, but we need big steps. So we need to look at some of these bigger, more transformation opportunities. And actually, telecoms is in a fantastic position to deliver um, this, because if you, if you have more distributed workloads, more edge-based compute, it's much easier to find a home for that heat. But that's another discussion. Let's go back to today's conversation. No, this is fantastic stuff. I mean, this is why we're here uh, having this uh, live panel, having this conversation. These are responses to a question from the industry. So this is uh, great stuff and lots of really great points and good ideas there. So uh, fantastic feedback to that question. Um, so Guy, at this point, I'm going to hand over to you for the next uh, uh, part of the show. Yep, thank you very much, Ray. I just want to echo that. Some amazing and uh, really smart ideas we're hearing today on the summit. But now it is time to check in on our audience poll for our Green Network Summit. As usual, we have one question, seven answer options, and remember you can pick whichever ones you feel are the most relevant. And the question we are asking this week is, how can telcos most effectively reduce their energy consumption levels? And you can see the real time votes right here. The poll went live this week. Um, and of course you can vote for more than one, which is why the percentages don't add up. But um, an amazingly strong and high number of people saying source more power energy efficient technology from vendors. Absolutely. Look at that. Top of the list so far. Um, and uh, I'm rather pleased to see that uh, we don't have too many people uh, saying do nothing. Uh, oh, I've just seen a number change there. Uh, share physical network resources has just changed as we've been speaking because this really is a live vote. Now, if you've yet to vote, then please do so because the more the better. And we're keeping the polls open and take another look in tomorrow's live Q&A show. Right, now we still have plenty of time for questions and we're getting so many questions in that We'll say it now, if we don't get to your questions today, we will prioritize them for tomorrow's show because we have got so many. Uh, but uh, let's get in some more if you can. So over to you, Ray. Yeah, uh, thanks, Guy. And uh, yes, good to see that uh, there was zero votes there for the do nothing. It's not worth it uh, on that poll result. <laughs> that's, that's pretty encouraging. Uh, so uh, the next question we have from the Telecom TV community is, is it easier to monitor and measure energy consumption in fixed and data transport networks as opposed to wireless and mobile networks? Um, so this seems like uh, a good question maybe to, to come to you, Matthias, uh, first uh, with this one, um, because obviously you are in the on the domain of the the, the fixed and data transport networks. Uh, do, you, do you feel it might be many, uh, any easier for you to, uh, to measure these kind of metrics uh, in, in the kind of networks you're dealing with? Uh, I think that's a really good question. Obviously, I have a limited uh, sort of knowledge of, of running a wireless network because we're running a wireline network. Uh, I, I think measuring our own power consumption uh, in our own backbone, whatever we are using, that should be doable. Uh, we're starting to do that. We're still struggling with, with some companies to share their data with us. That's a bit of a shame. Uh, in some data centers, we're still pa paying for power consumed, not really for power consumed, we're paying for power that we could potentially use. Uh, so you're paying something where you don't really know your own power consumption and that sort of stuff. So there are still ways we need to improve in our side. But I would argue that measuring power on your own backbone as a fixed line operator should be doable. It should absolutely be doable. Uh, we are, though, in many, many countries, we, there's a lot of leased lines in our networks. So we're very dependent on others to help us. But I would argue that, yeah, most likely it's a bit simpler to do it on our network than, than doing it on a wireless network. But I think, you know, we have some wireless people here. They can probably tell us how they see this, but we should be able to do much better on the wireline network that I represent here. Okay, uh, excellent. Um, and uh, 
Gil, do you want to, to come in on this one? I mean, is it easier to, to, to measure uh, energy consumption and, and what's going on in the network in, in any particular kind of networks or is it pretty much the same across the board? I, I would like to, my, my comment it's around the, let's say the data center, the cloud side. So whether it's a, a RAN, a wireless network or the core of the wireless network or anything really that runs in the data center, we can very accurately uh, measure in a programmatic way in real time the power consumption of the application uh, and the hardware. So basically all the different hardware components and also correlated to the application. So if an application consumes X amount of cores, for example, memory, data throughput, we can measure it in real time, <clears throat> how much power consumption in a very accurate way. And if you have the right infrastructure built into the platform itself, the software platform, it can basically correlate this uh, and to the, like I said, to the application that's running and reporting it. And then using AI, for example, you can basically analyze this data and through closed loop automation, for example, you know, predict things and adjust uh, in real time. And so the power profiles to save power. So it's definitely, regardless of whether it's wireless or fix uh, everything that has to do with the cloud part it's uh, it is very easy to measure the power okay uh, and just a, a a quick follow up on that one gil i mean is it do you think that it, as more and more processes become automated and more and more uh, network functions and applications are virtualized and and sharing server infrastructure will that possibly make things uh, uh, easier as well in terms of collecting data and, and monitoring energy consumption? Um, yes, it does open a lot of uh, options and possibilities. If you're looking, for example, from a server perspective, today you know, um, like when you buy the server, what is the maximum power consumption that the server, the server will consume? But you don't really know Right, you know, depend on the service that runs on the application. What would be the real power consumption? You only know the the top, okay? With the technology that we have today in software and, like I said, through basically closed loop automation, you can get in a real time uh, this information and have the ability to basically say this application, when it operates in this way, it consumes this power, okay? And um, you know, as an industry working together, working as an ecosystem, we can get to a point where you basically can say, this application on this server, when it runs, will consume this amount of power. And then you can basically aggregate things. So basically said, if two type of application runs on the same server, okay, and if each consume a certain amount of power, what will be the total power consumption? So we definitely can get there and gives us a lot of uh, possibilities. If you look at the silicon uh, advancement, there are plenty of capabilities in the silicons that we can in real time adjust to, again, change the power profile and reduce uh, the power consumption if we don't need so much uh, CPU power, for example. Okay, excellent. Thanks very much, Gil. Great insights there. Um, okay, at this point, if nobody else wants to come in on this question, I'll hand back over to Guy. Yep. Thanks very much, Ray. Um, I'm just looking down at a question we, we've just got in a couple of minutes ago here. Um, this might be our final question today. or Let's see, we might be able to get another one in as well. But we've had a, a question just come in the past 30 minutes or so. Um, we all agree that sustainability considerations and improved energy efficiency are essential as we move forward. But how will it be financed? Will it be financed through cost savings? Will it be financed through new investments or any other roads? Anybody got any any idea or, or thoughts as to, to how all this might be financed? As I say, it's a question we've just had whilst we've been speaking. Any of our guests want to have a stab at, 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 at this possibly tricky question? Uh, Matthias first, and uh, I think then we'll go to Gil. But Matthias, let's start with you. Yeah, no, I, I actually, I can only refer to some of our own projects we've had here. You know, during 2022, we actually removed the SDH platform. Uh, it actually worked really well. Customers loved it, but it's producing 
too much power. So therefore it's inefficient compared to other solutions that we can provide. So obviously I think if you look at those type of business cases, it needs to be financed by ourselves. And it, we could actually do that business case calculation by saying, okay, if we remove this platform entirely, we will save 300 kilowatts of power in the end. We will save more than a megawatt of power over, the, over time. And therefore the new solution is much more efficient uh, and it still provides the customer with the same type of service. So I would say most of this thing can be done by yourself and your own investment. Then obviously uh, moving out of a large, inefficient data center to a much better efficient data center, that cost is enormous to move all the equipment. So that's gonna be tough. So maybe some incentives needs to come in here, but I think many things can be supported by your own investment budget because you can run the network so much more efficiently if you run into new new stuff. So I think, you know, partly or mostly it should be done by us operators ourselves. Great. Thanks, Matthias. So mo mostly ourselves, but um, obviously for for um, some measures, we're going to need some some financial incentive or financial assistance. Right. It looks like we all want to comment on this one. So let me come first of all to Gil. Yeah, I think uh, uh, the funny part, it's a, you know, compensation drive behavior if you really look at this. So uh, if you look at the situation where today, especially in, in the European market, but all over the world, uh, we see similar phenomenon. The cost of energy, it's three to four times of what it was, for example, less than two years ago. Okay, so this is the biggest, I would say, driver for it. And uh, th this is one of the reasons, uh, you know, power consumption become top agenda for operator because it does hit them in the, you know, bottom line, in the profitability, okay? So it will finance itself to some extent because it is very expensive. So you need to reduce this cost. So now it's becoming, if I need to pay a certain amount of money and it saves me a lot more, okay, I'm going to do this. And there is, of course, also a place for, I would say, the regulators, okay, on certain incentives that they can provide, okay, the governments, for example, when you look at the selling spectrum, okay, one of the, uh, you know, the parameters can be, you know, uh, it's not just about the price, but also how you're going to operate this spectrum. If you're going to operate it a more efficient way, you can uh, show that you can operate it in less power consumption, you'll get certain, you know, higher scoring in the selection of uh, wording to you, the spectrum. So this can be another type of, let's say, incentive. And um, another thing can be with, you know, if you consume less power, you get certain discounts on the on the power, them, the power itself. You know, it's like, you know, at your home, you operate, uh, you know, certain machines at night because you pay less, okay? And you can look at it as a, the same way. But I would say the biggest thing, it's the cost of the power. And uh, you see in, in the parallel industry, in the car industry, uh, you know, driving uh, toward the electric uh, car versus a gas fueled car, really the biggest driver, it's uh, not, uh, you know, uh, the pollution as much as the cost of the gas, okay? So, uh, of course, everyone likes to say green and everything, but it was to a point where the gas price was became high enough to drive it to be, you know, cost efficient to buy an electric car. Before this, for a long time, um, you know, the saving was not there. So I think this is part of the dynamic we're going, we're seeing and we'll see even more in the telco industry. Yeah, thanks very much, Gil. Um, although I'm hearing from uh, neighbours that the cost of charging electric cars, certainly here in the UK, if you use one of those fast charge public points, is, is about on par with what the cost of, of petrol is now. Um, it's very, very unstable. Uh, Terry, let's come across to you for our comments next on, on this whole issue of uh, how do we fund it? No, I think uh, I'm, I'm very much agreeing with what Matthias was saying, I think, uh, from the very beginning. But, but I think it's important to say that there are different number of different actions uh, or activities uh, that can be taken. Of course, some of the simpler ones, quicker ones, are probably features, new features, which are typically coming, for example, with, with 5G. Uh, could be switching off some, some, uh, some carriers or some antenna elements and so on. Uh, and these typically are call it self-financed in a way that you are just using your equipment uh, in, a, in a smarter way. Uh, then, of course, there are could be a potential or a request for new systems, uh, which, of course, could drive a uh, cost uh, that could partly be financed by 
by lower energy uh, consumption, but it could, could also be other things we can get out of that. For example, if you're using an AI, for example, typically you, you get more in the information, uh, not only the energy consumption, but you get the information about, uh, you know, uh, service quality, traffic patterns and so forth, which could have a value by itself. So it could also be partly uh, you know, uh, uh, financing and new, and new systems. Then, of course, we have the full range of, of sunsetting and simplification, uh, which also could be uh, financed from, from the, the, the cost savings or, or, or uh, having simpler operations, for example, uh, moving from, from, from T 3G uh, and to, to into 5G, for example, on some spectrum bands. Uh, so so there, are, there are various, I think, ways to, to uh, to finance this or think about, you know, how you can justify it in, in, a, in a business case as such. Then I think, of course, what also Matthias said that uh, any kind of major upgrades or, or shifting that data centers is a story by itself. I think you have to be, have to ju be justified, uh, I think, there. But coming back to the original question, I think there was also about, uh, about energy at large. Uh, so it's not only about energy efficiency, I think. Uh, and that, let's not forget about the other aspect of this uh, power purchasing agreements, for example. Uh, clean sources and clean energy, uh, which typically has uh, coming from the climate story, and then, then of course it's a specific financing to uh, to purchase those those agreements. So, so they have a broad range of actions I think to be taken, and it could be a different logic uh, when it comes to financing or funding or justifying each of these uh, each of these actions. I think. Yeah, thanks, Terry. Lots of elements here, and um, and as Gil was saying just just earlier, there, you know, do do not underestimate the the cost of energy and uh, the need to to source cheaper and alternatives as well, and greener fuel sources. Uh, it does look like this could be our last question because we are heading to the end of the program. So, Philip, let me come to you uh, to uh, round out this particular set of answers. Yeah, on, I mean, on the question of finance, I think again, I would look to other industries. Um, particularly industries which have long-term investments, um, you know, they they have um, approached the finance in a different way, and and they think about um, the investments in terms of um, the, the longer term and in terms of climate resilience, and that's a concept we in telecoms haven't fully adopted, but basically the concept of climate resilience is I've got to look at my investments and I've got to think. What could happen in five, seven, ten years to the market, to the regulation, to what have you? Am I going to end up with a stranded asset? Am I going to end up with an asset that is, I have to start again? Am I going to end up with data centers that are non-compliant? And you build that in and you factor climate resilience into your investments today. You can still use a financial framework, but you're just thinking about it differently. And you're accepting and you're acknowledging the need to anticipate changes and to anticipate regulation and to anticipate standards. So you're taking a much more future proof look. So, it, you know, it's it's you're not you're not you're not having to compromise. You're just having to change your financial framework and you're having to think about the numbers in a different way. So it's about learning these new financial assessment skills. It's about not just looking at TCO, which is total cost of ownership, but total climate impact of ownership. And thinking that, thinking about that life cycle in that way, so I think there's some tricks we need to learn from other industries, and those tricks will help us to factor this in. So yeah, there are choices. Of course, there are choices, and there are financial investments that need to be made. We just need to figure out the right frameworks that allow us to make these financial choices, that also get us quicker to our climate choices, our climate goals. Thank you very much, Philip. Nice you said. Uh, well, we are out of time now. Thank you so much to all of our guests who joined us for this live programme and to our audience for sending in their questions. We've had some terrific, very smart answers and ideas um, to those questions. Now, as I said earlier, we do have several questions remaining and we will make sure that we look at those in tomorrow's show. Yeah, and do remember to send in your questions for our live Q&A shows as soon as you can. Don't leave it too late. And don't forget the poll question as well. There's still time for you to have your say and influence the final results. So vote now.
Yes, vote now, you still have time. And please join us tomorrow for the second day of the Green Network Summit. And we have two panel discussions for you. Plus, of course, another live Q&A show. Goodbye for now. Thank you.